I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. The second impeachment trial of Donald Trump is scheduled to begin just a few days from now. There's a single article of impeachment, incitement of insurrection. It stems from the speech Trump gave at a rally where he repeated the big lie that the election was stolen and he urged the crowd not to let Congress certify the Electoral College votes that day. The mob filled with militia groups, Proud Boys, QAnon followers stormed and trashed the Capitol, took over the Senate floor. All this as members of Congress and their staffs cowered for their lives. Less than three weeks later, 45 Republican senators voted to dismiss the impeachment as unconstitutional. The Times quoted Susan Collins, Senator from Maine, as saying, I think it's pretty obvious that it is extraordinary, unlikely that the president will be convicted. Just do the math. Given both the math and the shocking events of January 6th, what are the political risks from impeachment for the Democrats, the Republicans, and for President Biden? Will the Democrats ultimately take an off-ramp like censuring Trump? And meanwhile, Republicans are facing another hot button issue, what to do about the extremists and conspiracy theorists in their own ranks, like QAnon Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. Lots to talk about with Alex Burns, national political correspondent for the New York Times, Reed Epstein, political correspondent for the Times, and Annie Carney, a White House correspondent for the Times. Annie, let's start with you. Where does the president stand on impeachment? Does he want this trial to go ahead? Does he want it to go ahead quickly? Is it holding up his agenda? Does he want the president to be convicted? I just had to do a double take right there, I have to admit, and thought you were asking me about Trump. Uh, mm -hmm. Still in an adjustment period here. Uh, the President Biden has really not wanted to touch this. Uh, his White House press secretary, Jen Psaki, has been asked multiple times about um, to, to where they stand on impeachment. And she says he is concerned with the COVID relief package. That's what he wants to be working on. That's what they want to be talking about. Um, they've said over and over, despite what the public they spend very little time talking or thinking about Donald Trump in that White House. I find that a little hard to believe given what they're working on unrolling. But the point is they don't want to get enmeshed in this. Biden did say uh, to CNN that he thinks that a trial has to happen, but that's the extent of his remarks. He is trying to say Congress has a job to do. They need to do their job. It's not my job. I have you know, multiple crises of a generation to deal with and Donald Trump's impeachment trial isn't one of them. Reed, of course, uh, it is up to Congress. It is up to the rules of Congress to uh, follow through on this trial. But doesn't Congress look, or does it not, look to any guidance from the President of the United States, particularly the Democratic senators, what to do? Joe Biden is the leader of the Democratic Party at this point. Um, but it's important to remember that this is not a cult of personality in the way that the Republican Party had known with Donald Trump for the last four years or even the way that Democrats were uh, behind Barack Obama when he was the president. It's a, it's a much more distributed uh, sort of model of politics here. And when you talk to Democrats around the country, uh, they seem much more interested in sort of the, the stimulus checks that may come in a COVID package and certainly the vaccine distribution than they are in an impeachment trial. And so I don't know that we're seeing sort of the sort of grassroots pressure on some of these Senate Democrats uh, or certainly on Senate Republicans to impeach the president that maybe we saw in the immediate aftermath of, of the January 6th riots uh, or certainly of during the, the first impeachment trial, uh, however many months ago, 16 months ago that was. And so, uh, you know, I, I don't know that they're necessarily taking their cues from the president uh, as much as they, they as, what way, as it always works, where they take their cues from sort of the volume of response that they get from their constituents. So a month has gone by, or just about a month since January 6th. Alex, uh, has this now become a sideshow that everybody wants to get over with, or 
How does it go from here? Is there going to be an actual trial? Are there going to be witnesses? Or is this going to be, uh, is it going to be a fait accompli given the fact that 45 senators say it's unconstitutional to begin with? Well, Sam, I don't think it's going to be a, a sideshow. And, and I do think that uh, while I think Reid is clearly right that the uh, pressure from Democratic voters is very much in the direction of uh, accomplishing things through legislation, uh, I can tell you from, you know, from my own reporting, uh, Democratic members of Congress feel extremely determined uh, to carry out uh, an impeachment trial and to push for a conviction because uh, they feel uh, and with ample factual basis that they were uh, personally attacked by the mob that uh, stormed the Capitol about a month ago. So, you know, going back to the immediate aftermath uh, of January 6th, there was all kinds of ambivalence at, uh, you know, certain senior levels of the Democratic Party about whether it made sense to take the time to uh, impeach a president who was going to leave office in two weeks anyway. But uh, within the House Democratic Caucus and, you know, increasingly, I think among Senate Democrats, there was a pretty rapid recognition that uh, this was going to happen, that members were going to impeach the president now, with or without the support uh, of the incoming administration. And of course, that's exactly what uh, they have done. We don't know all the parameters uh, of the trial yet. There is going to be a trial in this upcoming uh, week. But what we don't know is you know, how many witnesses uh, will be called, what kind of witnesses will be called. Uh, are Senate Democrats who, you know, an important difference from the last impeachment process is that they actually do control uh, the Senate now. So they do have the power to uh, issue subpoenas and so forth. And the question is, you know, and this goes to the point of whether they're actually going to try uh, against all odds to push for a conviction. Or are they willing to take the time to issue subpoenas, to go to court, to force people uh, to testify if they feel uh, like that's what's necessary? Or uh, is this at the point where they feel like, you know, we're not going to get a conviction. We will, we will probably get a majority of the Senate and uh, a handful of Republicans who did not vote for impeachment last time. Last time it was just Mitt Romney uh, who voted to convict uh, President Trump in his first impeachment trial. But, you know, are you willing to uh, potentially stall other priorities like confirming uh, cabinet officials or like a uh, slow walking other kinds of uh, legislative goals in order to uh, pursue some big game changer that would have to fundamentally uh, shift the dynamics of the impeachment debate. And so what are the alternatives? Is censure an alternative? Is persuading uh, Republicans to convict is an alternative? Uh, what are the options that are on the table? I think censure clearly is something that could develop if it becomes obvious in the course of the trial that it's awfully embarrassing for our Republicans to just vote to acquit the president and to the former president, I should say. I'm, I'm in Annie's camp of uh, still in this adjustment phase. But if it becomes really uncomfortable for Republicans, especially in some of these swing states uh, where they're up for election next year, uh, to just totally let him off the hook, that yeah, censure is clearly uh, an option. Although, again, I think that you know being impeached by the House and tried in the Senate is sort of a form of censure uh, on its own. And I don't know how much appetite there would be for saying this really has no force. It's a symbolic gesture, but you know we're going to spend some more uh, time on this. I do think there's a lot of conversation in both parties about uh, legal consequences that the president might face, excuse me, the former president might face uh, outside uh, of the context of Congress. You have multiple uh, district attorneys and potentially uh, federal investigations that are looking into him, uh, into the into Trump and his businesses for a uh, different, uh, you know, from different angles. And, you know, I think that if he does, if he is seen as sort of getting off scot-free in the impeachment trial, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure uh, on those other entities to pursue him for other uh, infractions. Reed, do we have any better sense of the constitutionality of what the Senate is about to do? Can you convict a former president? Can you impose penalties on a former president? Uh, I mean, there doesn't seem to be like that much that much doubt that you can. Um, you know, none of this, of course, has been tested in any sort of court. And so, uh, you know, if if the former president were to be convicted and then tried to run again. Uh, you know, it would go to court. And, you know, I guess we'd find out what the Supreme Court thinks of the constitutionality of all this. I mean, one thing I wanted to go back to the discussion about the censure too. You know, I don't know that there's much value in some of these Republicans in voting to censure uh, the former President Trump because you're talking about a Republican party that's really dealing with a binary question of whether you're loyal to Trump or not. Uh, and some of those, the the voters and certainly the, the former president and his, his close allies aren't necessarily going to look at a censure vote and say, you know, that's okay. 
it, it's going to be just as, as risky for some of these Republican senators as an impeachment vote might be. Uh, Annie, you've written about the fact that the extremist wing in the Republican Party has been emboldened uh, now. Uh, how do we define extremists these days? It seems like we're pushing the envelope a little bit. I think across the country at the state party level, we've been seeing a divide over people who, you know, I mean, the divide is really about whether or not you believe the big lie or you don't. And and it's almost like the it's establishment to say that Biden rightfully won this election. And, you know, we've seen it in, in the story we wrote this weekend, we outlined what's happening in Washington state where at the state party level, they called, they passed a resolution um, calling the attack on January 6th at the Capitol, a false flag operation saying it didn't really happen. In Michigan, there's militias and a state co-party chairman is running uh, um, with no, no one else running. She was someone who was at the rally on January 6th and marched to the Capitol and believes that, you know, has been part of Stop the Steal. And um, all over the country, there are these fissures. Um, and, and at the top of the party, we have leaders like Ronna McDaniel, the chairwoman of the Republican National Committee, and who are caught between, do we denounce these people? Uh, but you know, 41% of the party believes that Trump rightfully won this election. And it, it, you can't, they see that Donald Trump brought in a lot of new voters to the Republican party and they're scared to that denouncing these outright potentially um, people like Marjorie Taylor Greene spouting conspiracy theories would mean a dissolution of the whole party, tearing the party into two and the end of, of Republicans. So what the leaders at the top are trying to say is that an inter-party fight helps no one win elections. It will not help them win seats back in 2022. The, you know, the attacks against Liz Cheney need to stop, but they're in this catch where spouting, saying you, we need a Republican unity means they can't then attack the attackers. Uh, I interviewed Ronna McDaniel who, you know, wants Matt Gates to stop attacking Liz Cheney, but she can't attack Matt Gates because she's saying no Republican should attack another Republican. Uh, so it's, it's not, it's a tough position to, to lead from. Um, and then there's, there's a view that um, McCarthy has to deal with people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and there is some sense that, oh, and the, sorry, a lot of the leaders of the party have this view that voters don't like when Washington comes in and imposes their view. They, they, they say all the time, we trust the voters. Marjorie Taylor Greene got elected to, to come in and, and set, you know, strip her of her committees or talk about getting, trying to undermine her or run a candidate against her. They, they think the Republican voters really recoil at Washington coming in and imposing its way. So they're, they're scared to alienate her and fearing that she might get worse versus including her and maybe they could convince her to drop some of this. So they're in a real bind about, about what to do. And some of the mechanisms of controlling the party like big donors, um, funding candidates that the establishment picks isn't working as well when, when small donors are fueling so much uh, of, of campaign contributions. Marjorie Taylor Greene has been raising a ton of money over the past days that she's been in the news from grassroots fundraising. Um, so it's not clear that the leaders of the party have control over this radical wing that is coming up from the grassroots. And of course, we've seen that Donald Trump himself raised uh, $250 million or more uh, for no reason, uh, just because he said he had lost the election. And now we're not even sure what he's going to do with that. Reid, uh, you pointed out in a story in the Times that the Democrats are now running an ad campaign uh, against uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, even Mitch McConnell says that some of the things she says are loony. Uh, where do the Republicans draw the line? As Annie says, how do they draw the line? Uh, and how do they separate themselves from someone like her? Where is the line against extremism in the party? Well, I think it's instructive to look at what they've done in the past. Uh, it was around this time, two years ago, uh, Steve King was a congressman from Iowa who 
had sort of fished in some of these same waters, less on the conspiracy theory and more on uh, more outright racist things that he had said. And uh, it was actually an interview with our colleague, Trip Gabriel, that led to Kevin McCarthy excising, uh, excising Congressman King from the party uh, effectively, uh, stripping his committee assignments and, and making him a, a congressman with, with virtually nothing to do. Uh, that sort of led to King being ostracized by donors. He wound up losing in a primary uh, in 2020 to a, a slightly less conservative Republican in Iowa. Uh, and now he's, he's a retired uh, member of Congress. Uh, you know, the, the difference with Marjorie Taylor Greene is that she's much better at sort of promoting herself independently than Steve King ever was. Uh, she's more active on social media. She of course has a tie to uh, former President Trump uh, that she has uh, she has nurtured much more than King did. Uh, and so we'll see whether, whether they look to use the same template that, that Kevin McCarthy used two years ago with King. Alex, uh, you've written about the civil war in the Republican party. Does the party want to make a break from Donald Trump? Does it want to be a non-Trump party? As Annie said, 40% of those Republicans think that Trump still won the election. How does, uh, the party deal with those people when obviously Trump is no longer the president? Well, Sam, I think that's really the key uh, distinction there that I think most people at a leadership level of the Republican Party, uh, if they were uh, offered a deal where uh, they could wave a magic wand and President Trump would uh, never do another interview, uh, never uh, return to social media, and just sort of play golf uh, in Florida for the rest of his days, uh, I think they would take that uh, deal in a second. They would wave that wand in a second. They would not hesitate. Um, but obviously, that's not an option for them. And in some ways, it's, uh, it can be kind of reductive and uh, self-serving for party leaders to make the issue a uh, President Trump, a former President Trump, uh, when the issue is uh, also the, uh, the demands and desires of their political base. This is a voter-driven uh, phenomenon in a lot of these places that you know President Trump uh, captured and electrified in a way that uh, no other Republican at that level of politics uh, managed to do. So, you know, part of the challenge here for the party is, yes, in the short term, uh, figuring out what do you do about somebody uh, like Marjorie Taylor Greene? What do you do about uh, some of the other extreme right members of the House who were involved uh, in the events of January 6th before the attack on the Capitol? Uh, and there are, it's, it's more than Marjorie Taylor Greene. There are you know, five, six, seven of them who are really seen as uh, having had a pretty a direct hand in the rally that preceded uh, the attack. Um, but over the long term, the question uh, for leaders of the Republican Party is not just, you know, can you manage to contain these forces, but can you offer your voters uh, something else that will be uh, more compelling to them uh, than the more far out stuff that has obviously taken hold uh, in a lot of these uh, relatively low turnout primary elections in a solid red Republican district. And this is sort of the, you know, somebody like a, a former President Trump doesn't come out of nowhere as a political force. You know, somebody, you've, we've seen many people try to cross over from uh, the worlds of celebrity uh, and media into the world of electoral politics and totally fall flat. They don't succeed uh, the way uh, uh, Trump did unless they are offering something that voters want and unless they are filling a vacuum that other people have left for them. And so I think when we look ahead to uh, the 2022 uh, and 2024 uh, presidential election and the primaries that uh, frankly are really starting even now in states where uh, Senate seats, governorships, uh, house races are uh, up for grabs in an important way, uh, the challenge is, do you have Republican candidates? You know, does this for the Republican Party just become you know, the litmus test that uh, Reid was mentioning before. Are you pro-Trump uh, or are you anti-Trump? Are you 100% loyal or are you, uh, you know, have you committed some kind of heresy? But, you know, are you putting something on the table that is that is actually frames your appeal uh, and offers something to your average Republican voter that is not just a blind loyalty uh, to the former president? And frankly, it's just too early to see uh, whether that's going to happen. I do think it's one of the real challenges for the party in dragging out first impeachment uh, and then uh, the controversies around people like uh, Congresswoman Green that, you know, if you are going to put forward an alternative agenda, you're certainly not going to do it in the course of an impeachment trial or in the course of you know, hand wringing about whether Liz Cheney gets to keep her leadership job.
Reed, that vacuum goes to something that you were saying earlier. Uh, what do the Republicans do on things like the vaccine, where you now have a anti-vaccine faction uh, hooking up with the anti-mask people, uh, and also on the aid package that the president is pushing that uh, some of the Republicans at least say is too generous. So do they benefit from cooperating with the White House, or do they benefit in, in still being naysayers on these issues? I mean, I think it depends particularly on the the, the stimulus idea, you know, Republicans are all over the place on this. You know, remember the $2,000 idea initiated with, with Trump himself. Uh, you had the Republican governor of West Virginia was on cable news this week, pressuring the Democratic senator of West Virginia to spend more money. Uh, and so, you know, on that issue, it, it's, it's a very, you know, it breaks down almost on a populist versus establishment or traditional Republicans line where uh, the populists want to get checks into people's hands, uh, much in the way that, that Democrats do. Uh, and you have sort of old school Republicans who worry about things like government debt uh, and spending that almost seem quaint in this era uh, that are, are trying to limit the size of the package. And that was really the group of Republicans that went to the White House to try to talk Biden into cutting the size of the stimulus package by two thirds, uh, which sounds like it did not uh, get much of a reception from President Biden uh, or from very many Democrats. Um, the vaccine issue is a little bit trickier, but like you said, it uh, it sort of picks different uh, elements of the sort of fringes or what used to be the fringes of the Republican party and now are, are sort of a sizable percentage of the base. Uh, and I don't know that that anybody other than Trump himself has much credibility to speak to those people about the usefulness of vaccines or masks. Uh, he certainly, Trump has not been willing uh, and has resisted wearing masks himself. We haven't heard much from him uh, when he was in office or certainly since about the utility of vaccines or whether his supporters should be seeking them out. And, 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 I, and so we don't know, uh, there just haven't been, there aren't a lot of credible messengers to that, that part of the party other than Trump himself. And, and he's been very quiet on this. Yeah. Vice President Mike Pence, former Vice President Mike Pence, publicly got the vaccine The Donald Trump never did. He said, maybe I'll take it. I'm still protected from the, rem the drugs that I took when I had COVID myself. But he, while still in office, was very aware that a large percent of his base is anti-vaxxers who are skeptical of the vaccine, and he did nothing to really push back on that. Annie, I know uh, things are very different in a pandemic. Uh, our coverage has been uh, affected vastly. But what is the Biden White House like compared to the Trump White House? What is the, the mood, the character, the atmosphere like in the White House, as best you can tell, compared to what it was under Trump? It's very locked down right now. 70% of the West Wing staff is still working from home, so it's empty but they have very serious health precautions in place. Um, they, they all wear N95 masks. Most of them are double masking. They eat lunch with their doors closed. They do senior staff meetings, even though they're in the building, they do it on Zoom with their doors closed in their offices. They have a limit on the number of people allowed into the Oval Office or allowed into the Chief of Staff's office and they have time limits on interactions. They keep in-person interaction to 15 minutes. So it's like doctor's orders first, which is very different from what we saw in the Trump White House. Even in the end, when it was clearing out, there were still people like Sidney Powell and Mike Lindell somehow getting into the Oval that no one knew really how they got there. Uh, it still had that Wild West feel all up until the very end. Um, there's also some niceties that I'm sure will wear off um, between the press and the communication staff. They're all excited to be there. We're all a little bit exhausted. Um, they, you know, want to work with us and want to know what we're working on and respond to emails. That's all foreign to people who have been covering this past administration where they didn't respond to us at all. Um, I'm sure that can't go on. Um, I don't know how Jen Psaki can respond to every email. 
uh, for the long term. Um, but they there's definitely a excitement and enthusiasm to turn the page and to um, do things differently. However long that lasts. Yeah. Right? Alex, you know, you uh, know, what will last very quickly? Yeah. No, some of those uh, uh, also sound like just uh, good management practices, right? That I think they're probably a uh, past White House chiefs of staff who would have loved to mandate, you know, a 15 minute max on in-person interactions and only so many people can be in the Oval Office. And, you know, now they've got a pretty big lever to make that happen. It sounds like a good idea for all kinds of meetings. Thanks to Annie Carney, Reed Epstein, and Alex Burns of the New York Times. And for the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.